Good morning to the West Coasters and good afternoon to the Americans, Mid Eastern uh, Standard Time, West East Coasters. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Sigal Yaniv Feller, Deputy Director of uh, JFN Israel. And um, together with Marla and Sherry Fox, we've been running the Green Funders Forum as one of JFN's peer interest groups or affinity groups that we have within JFN to bring funders around mutual fields of interest that, uh, that funders have. And this one is actually the largest peer interest group that JFN has, and it's been very active in the past few years. We're very, very happy you all could join us today. I'm going to hand it over to Marla to do a formal opening and also tell you what, uh, what's on the table for today, literally on the table, because we have some good table stuff for you. And uh, we'll re-meet throughout the session. So please enjoy. Thank you, Sigal. I'm Marla. I'm Marla Stein. I'm the co-chair of the Green Funders Forum, along with Sherry Fox. And along with my thanks to Sigal, I also want to thank in advance Gil Yako. Gil, you can raise your hand, who is part of the Green Funders Forum team as the consultant. And also a big thank you to Gabi Shani of the Menmon Fund, who really initiated this program and uh, really helped organize and definitely recruited all of our great speakers. Uh, the Green Funders Forum we consider to be the address for people funding in Israel's environment or who are interested in learning more. You may be interested in the environment as a major funding area. You may be interested in how it can, you can intersect the environment with your other funding priorities. Or you might be interested in setting aside a portion of your grant making as a kind of insurance policy. Because I think it's fair to say that we all care about the air we breathe the food we eat and the water we drink. And all of this is the environment and more, the cities that we build and the transportation systems that we need. Um, and all of this is crucial. So wherever you are in your journey, the Green Funders Forum is the resource to help you move from awareness and education to taking action and making an impact. Uh, we're also happy to share that we're working on a few collaboratives in the short term, we have a group of funders who are funding a lobbyist for the environmental movement underneath the umbrella group, Life and Environment. And we're also laying the groundwork of a broader funders collaborative regarding Israel's environment. We're hoping to launch this fund at the beginning of 2022. So stay tuned for more information. This is definitely the time to be involved in the environment. We have so many opportunities now and a lot of excellent friends in the Knesset, including Professor Alon Tal, who many of you know and has addressed this forum many times. We're really excited that he made it into the Knesset. In this session, we're going to be exploring specifically food, animal welfare, and the environment, which is a perfect example of how the environment intersects with so many issues. The session was initiated by funders who care about animal welfare and food and consider themselves a subgroup of the Green Funders Forum. And just to say, we are delighted when people come to us with ideas and we are happy for these kinds of initiatives and to be a resource. In terms of tonight's programs, uh, first we're going to welcome Eitan Schwartz, who is the Tel Aviv municipality spokesperson. And he'll be speaking about Tel Aviv and how it became a vegan capital, world capital. And then we'll hear from Gabi Shani of the Menmon Fund, who will speak about mapping the field of animal welfare and the environment in Israel. Um, and then we will hear from three additional funders on their perspectives and motivations on animal welfare, food, and the environment, Danielle Eden Scheinberg, Rabbi Adam Frank, and Yonatan Inbar. Uh, and finally, we'll have a cooking session featuring a vegan friendly family dinner ideas with Lynn Weinstein. And so with that, I'm happy to welcome Eitan Schwartz, who has been serving in senior positions in the Tel Aviv Yafo municipality for the past 12 years and currently serves as the head of communications and media. Eitan previously served for four years as the CEO of Tel Aviv Global, an, initi an, an initiative aimed at promoting Tel Aviv as an international center of innovation. Among other honors, Eitan was named by Monocle magazine to be its part of its dream team of municipal officials and in 2004, Eitan won first place in the Ambassador TV show competition. Eitan resides in Tel Aviv with his wife and three children, has a BA from Columbia University in New York and an MA from Tel Aviv University. We're delighted to have Eitan with us today. Please note any questions that you might have in the chat. Welcome, Eitan. 
Thanks for that. Thanks for making the introduction. In my absence, I'm sure, it would have been embarrassing to hear. Um, yeah, but but thanks for having me and uh, and welcome everybody and um, good evening uh, from the sunset of Tel Aviv, which is shining on my face right now. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here, and um, I was asked to speak a bit about uh, two topics that are quite related. Uh, that we're very very proud of uh, what we do in the field here in the city of Tel Aviv. One has to do with um, uh, pets, dogs in particular, and their and their and their prominence and their importance in the city life in Tel Aviv. Uh, and the second one has to do with uh, vegetarian and vegan culture. So, I will um, I will with a few slides try to talk a bit about these two topics and uh, how important they are for us. Um, so. How did we become a leader in vegan and animal rights, um, vegan culture and animal rights? How did these two uh, link together? Uh, how is it that when you come to our city, uh, you see this everywhere, uh, uh, this, this, this freedom and this free spirit and this energy that everybody talks about um, um, is very much linked to the first part of what I wanna discuss, which has to do with us being a very, very uh, dog friendly city. Um, we're a very small city. There are about 450,000 residents uh, and it's about the size of the island of Manhattan. Um, and we have 40,000 uh, households that own dogs in the city. So with one out of every 10, maybe slightly less uh, households with a dog, we are probably uh, one of the leading cities in terms of the, um, I would say the, uh, the volume of dogs, uh, their presence in the public sphere um, uh, their importance in our city life. Uh, there are probably many, many reasons to that. We have a very, very young population in the city, and that's definitely linked to young people that um, sometimes live on their own and they, and they take in dogs. Uh, but I think it goes a lot to, to, to other things as well. Um, so with citywide festivals, many, 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 many activities, a hundred parks dedicated only to dogs, uh, four parts of our beaches, we have 13 beaches, so four beaches in which you can let your dog run free and, and even swim. So there's a lot of, um, of energy invested in, in various city uh, uh, agencies into making dog life here very, very, very fun and pleasant and making the dog owner's life uh, fun and pleasant. And I think the most novel thing that we have is something called Diggy Dog, um, which is a unique residence card for dogs and their owners. Um, so we have a, a city card, which is very successful, which is called Digital, which is Digital Tel Aviv. Um, and we have two sub clubs. One is Digital for, for young kids. So we give solutions and content um, and many, 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 many various projects for families that have young children between the age of, of, of newborns and three. And then we have the 40,000 dog owners in a specific club in which they get all kinds of stuff from perks in our dozens of, of pet stores uh, to workshops, um, special um, vaccination events, special festival for dogs. Um, my, the previous spokesperson of the municipality who was a dog owner himself, even organized screenings of movies for dogs. Um, um, there was a film that came out a few years ago, a cartoon, I think it was called The Secret Lives of Dogs. So they had a special screening on the roof where dogs and their owners came to see the film together. And that has to do with the, the very, very, very caring, um, the very caring uh, atmosphere we have for dogs in the city. And it's a very, very, very important segment of our population. Um, I'll say two things. Um, one is that we had a recent clash with this population. It's anecdotal, but it's something that happened in many, many cities around the world. Um, I'll talk about a, a phenomenon which is extremely uh, bothering to many, but it's a global phenomenon of dog feces in the street, which during Corona uh, rose dramatically in many, many, many cities around the world. This became a, a much more acute problem over the past year and a half in many cities. Uh, this too has many reasons, but people um, walked their dog more and were less inclined to uh, collect after the dog. So we recently had a huge campaign and it was in many ways, we used the network of the dog owners uh, in a sort of peer pressure uh, because it's a very, very small minority in the city that doesn't collect after their dogs, but it was something that was very, very troubling to a lot of the people living in the city. Um, uh, the second thing, if you will, I want to take it to a larger discussion, and this has to do with Jewish values as well. Um, you know, animals, 
as you know, have a have a very, very, very important uh, um, uh, part of, in, in the Jewish religion. And there's a lot of regulation and there's a lot of tradition surrounding animals. Um, and one of the things that the city of Tel Aviv does, uh, being a city that um, that celebrates tolerance and, and pluralism and human values and human rights, in this case, animal rights, uh, as a city, we also led groundbreaking city legislation that has to do with um, with animal rights. Um, I think one of the most important things we did a few years ago, the mayor of Tel Aviv, Ron Holday, led, uh, and, it, and, and like many of the actions that he did, it, re it required a lot of political uh, um, guts. Um, it is forbidden to carry out the tradition of kaparot. Uh, for those of you who know, the tradition that happens before the Day of the Atonement, where Orthodox Jews, um, uh, take a chicken and um, and perform a ritual in which they pass on their sins to the to the chicken and then kill the chicken. So this is something that is still very very common in many many Israeli communities. It's forbidden in the city of Tel Aviv Yafo. Uh, I, as a small kid, still remember this ritual in our main market, and it's no longer allowed in the city. And of course, there were parts of our Orthodox community that opposed uh, this legislation. Um, Circuses with live animal performances were forbidden in the city before they became forbidden in the city of Tel Aviv Yafo. Uh, this phenomenon of horses and carriages, which used to be popular, is forbidden in the city. So we were really, over the past two decades, on the forefront of animal rights when it has to do with the public sphere uh, here in the city. Um, and I think when we talk about how we see our values as a city embedded in animals, so the dog and their, and their, and their celebration here in the city is, uh, is uh, one manifestation of that. But there, I think there are other things which are very, very important that go to our value uh, system. Um, a second issue, which is, which is probably related in some sort, and it's interesting to discuss, is how we, were, how we emerged over the past 10 years as a vegan capital of the world, of a vegetarian and vegan capital of the world. Um, I will go to the larger picture, which is Tel Aviv as a city that sparks some international interest is a phenomenon that the mayor started leading about a, about a decade ago. We started noticing that Tel Aviv generates interest, um, both as a destination for a vacation, but also because of its very, very, very vibrant technical scene and technological scene. And we saw that um, world media uh, are discovering more and more interest in this very small city. Um, within that interest, our culinary scene has become very, very, very celebrated and, and well known for a city of our dimensions and size. And within that phenomenon of people talking about the new Israeli cuisine and even the new Tel Avivian cuisine, the issue of the abundance of vegetarian and vegan restaurants or restaurants that are vegetarian and vegan friendly in the city is something that has been discussed uh, in culinary uh, media and among people that deal with food. And it's true, we have a very, very, very high rate of all sorts of restaurants that serve vegan, vegetarian, or are friendly to those audiences. Um, a few years ago, we started leading a food policy in the city, which is very, very uh, innovative for a city in Israel, where we decided that the city has to interfere more with, with what, is, what is served in the public sphere, in public institutions, and also in private institutions. Um, the dietary uh, um, recommendations for our citizens and so on and so forth. Um, and in many cases, we're asked to explain why vegan and vegetarian culture are so prominent here in the city or in Israel in general. And it's very hard to explain why. I'll try to give a few reasons, uh, which I believe are very interesting and, and, and when we try to understand them. Uh, I think, first of all, as you know, Israel is a extremely small country with various types of, of, of ecosystems from desert to very, very uh, cool uh, uh, climates. Therefore, our local produce market produces a huge variety of produce, which is fresh and because of the size of the country also extremely available to everybody. Um, I used to live in New York, the, the, this, uh, this phenomenon where you sometimes live in certain neighborhoods where it's hard to have access even in a, in, in, a, in a major city to a wide variety of fresh produce. When I say fresh, that was grown over the past few days and, and is local. As you all know, it's something that doesn't really exist in this country. We have an abundance of everything and it's all very, very fresh and, and in most part it's locally grown. Um, and 
I would add to that the Jewish culture, uh, which which we all, I'm sure you all understand, but people that don't belong to this culture don't always understand that in a culture in which you can't mix a whole set of foods with another whole set of foods, meaning uh, meat products and dairy products, which are two categories in our culture, which don't exist in the same dissonance in other cultures, in, in our culture, in our religion, in our society, a third class of foods, which can be served with either one of those two categories becomes extremely important. So in our cuisine, even as uh, secular people in my house, the importance of the tomato is very, very high because I eat the tomato or I can serve the tomato with everything, uh, both to myself and to my mother-in-law who's Orthodox and the importance of lettuce and the importance of a banana and the importance of grains. These all become very important foods because they can be served throughout the day in, in all three meals and they're not excluded to one of the two types of foods. So I think that might explain why in our Jewish culture, um, together with the, the meaning of how it, how it meets Israeli abundance, uh, produces a very, very, very rich culinary scene for people that don't eat meat at all and don't uh, consume uh, milk products either. Um, these, are, these are the two main topics I, I, I wanted to share with you. Um, and I'll say as, uh, that um, as a city, we're very, very proud of these two phenomenons. We, 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 we use them uh, when we talk about the city, we use them in the promotion of the city. Um, obviously being a dog friendly city and being a vegetarian friendly city and a vegan friendly city, our values are very much appreciated uh, in our positioning efforts, in our marketing efforts. Um, and therefore I was very, very happy to have this invitation to come address you today. And I thank you for, uh, and I thank you for listening. Thank you, Eitan. We have a couple of minutes for questions if anyone wants to ask. And uh, you can also, I mean, you can, I, I think there is another explanation besides what you mentioned about uh, the vegan, you know, uh, the vegan scene in Israel and especially in Tel Aviv, uh, and actually it's, it became a trend uh, thanks to civil society uh, that created a lot of activities and created a hype and a very, um, you know, it became part of the fashion in a way. Uh, and, and that's how it became, you know, such a phenomena. I see a question in the chat. Uh, yeah. Okay, there is a question in the chat privately uh, that sometimes vegan restaurants are not necessarily environmental. How can we promote it? How can the Tel Aviv municipality can promote these values of environment, veganism, you know, smart consumerism? That's a, that's a fantastic question. And one of the things we, we're struggling with, and I'm not ashamed to say that I think we're lagging behind some of the countries we would like more to be uh, 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 associated with has to do with, um, with environmental concerns. I think we, uh, as a city, uh, the standard set in many of the establishments here is higher than the Israeli average, but as a nation, uh, we have a far way to go in many of the issues that, that, that Western countries uh, have already set as a standard. Um, we work very hard on, 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 on the public sphere. Um, we work very hard on places like beaches. Uh, we regulate the type of, um, of products um, and practices on the restaurants on the beachfront, which are very, very important spots. Um, but it's true uh, that I think Israeli society as a whole still has a lot to learn from other uh, countries uh, in the Western Hemisphere when it comes to daily, um, daily practices and, and, and uh, in the field of the environment. I will say that right now in, in our new government, um, these issues, I think, are much more important to the people that are serving in the current government. Uh, and I have a feeling that, at least in Israeli politics and in discourse, we will hear more about these issues um, than we have heard in the past few years. Hey, I totally agree. Another question from on Dean Sherman. Uh, wondering if there will be any investment in the Tel Aviv City Dog Shelter. Uh, on Dean actually volunteered there, and it's desperately needed improvements. And I heard it from other, uh, other members as well. I'm not- do you, have, do you have a yes or no answer to that? Or? I don't actually, I'm not, I, I don't know. Um, 
I, I know we're very proud of the shelter and, and, and I will tap into what you said before, working with organizations is, is extremely, extremely important. Um, and by the way, during Corona, it was even more important. Um, if I refer to what I discussed before, we know a lot of people adopted pets during Corona. And we know that there was also a phenomenon throughout the country of people abandoning their pets. Uh, and, and these abandoned pets, as always happens, made their way into the large cities, including ours. So a lot of new pets appeared in our streets and, and then arrived at our shelter. So um, I assume there's a growth of the dog population over the past year in Tel Aviv, a, a larger growth than usual. Um, okay. Um, thank you. Maybe another last question. Um, question. Sorry. I have a question. Can I address it? I put it in the chat. No. As you know, Judaism has powerful, powerful teaching on compassion for animals, but they are overlooked. And Trambali Chaya may be the over, most overlooked mitzvah. So I wonder what you think of the idea and working with some people to try to reestablish the ancient duty of animals. This is too much thought, where it's brought back by the Kabbalists and all, and to transform it into a day devoted to increasing awareness of Judaism's powerful teachings on compassion for animals and how far the realities of animals are from these teachings that's been fact reformed. So I wonder what you think of that idea. I didn't hear the last part of the question. Could you repeat it, please? Maybe, I'm not sure we have time, so you can address the well, first part. Yeah, right. <laughs> I'm sorry, we don't have time for all the questions, but if you can address uh, some of it, uh, it will be fine. Yeah. Um, the main idea is re-establishing the ancient New Year for animals to increase awareness of Jewish peoples and to show how far the realities for animals today are from these teachings, especially on factory farms, to get the issue into the general Jewish, uh, you know, uh, debates and uh, teachings and all that. Just as two responded. So maybe if I can, maybe I, just to make it shorter, do you? have any emphasis or efforts to create public awareness. And please, uh, for the others, please write in the chat so we can, we can have time to answer. So do you invest any time in awareness to the public and not just you know, responding to what's happening? Yes, we have, we have ongoing campaigns. I, my feeling is personally, uh, and I might be mistaken, uh, that, the, that the Tel Avivian uh, community is very compassionate towards uh, animals and dogs. I do not see I do not see, um, I do not see from, from where I sit, I usually see the complaints, I see the media appeals, and I also know what people call our call center, a municipal call center to complain about. It is you, issues of, of uh, mistreatment of animals are very, very rare, very rare. And when they happen, there is a, a general public outcry. I would say there's a lot of, from, from where I stand, at least in my interpretation, um, sometimes it's actually even the opposite. For instance, something that we deal with on a constant level, just so you understand, uh, we have many, 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 many cat feeders in the city. And I, if you know Tel Aviv and you know Israel, street cats are very, 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 very abundant in our streets. And it's not only illegal, we also supply, um, we supply the food and we supply the facilities to do it. And this is an ongoing, as part of city life, the, 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 the tension between various forces. There is a large community of cat feeders throughout the city. Some people like it, some people don't. I, as spokesperson, I always I receive, I receive uh, appeals and, and, and questions from reporters from both sides. Um, so what you, what you suggest is a fantastic idea. My perception is that is actually something that I think people uh, identify with in the city. Okay, I see, thank you. I see that there are other questions, but some of them would be for the next speakers because it's not necessarily the expertise, Ethan's expertise. Uh, so I want to thank you, Eitan. Thank you very much. And for your time, I know you're very busy uh, as a spokesperson. And you're welcome to stay. Thank you very much. Of course. And Marla, do you want to take it from here? Yes, yes. Thank you, Eitan. And I would love to speak to you privately about those cats. So um, okay. Uh, okay. that'll be another conversation. Uh, so now I'm pleased to introduce Gabi Shani who serves as the head of philanthropy for the Menmon Fund. And as I said, Gabi was really the initiative, the initiator behind this. And we're delighted that she did come to us because you can see that uh, we have a lot of people participating and, and these are huge issues. 
Um, Gabby has an impressive academic and business background, but a few years ago decided to move from business and, and more into promoting social initiatives. Um, and so at the Menmon Fund, Gabby is in charge of goals and visions of the fund, as well as the implementation on the day-to-day -day basis of the fund's initiatives. In addition, she creates connections with strategic partners, such as government bodies, NGOs, and other donors. Um, please, as we said, um, please note your questions in the chat and welcome, Gabby. Thank you, Marla. Thank you so much. Good evening, everyone. And thank you, Marla, for the supporting introduction. And in general, for the work you and Gil and uh, Sigal lead of this important environmental form. So mainly the idea behind this meeting today was actually to really deepen the connections we have between the animal field and the environmental field, those fields that are inseparable. We actually lately launched at the Menmon Foundation a program with the rooftop environmental organization in Israel, Ergun Chaim Vesviva, a program that will uh, address the connection between those fields. And I think not just those fields, you know, the animal field is not just connected to the environmental field. I will actually address in my talk today the fact that the animal field is related to all aspects of our society. It's related to our human, your health condition, it's related to our education and welfare work. And I think these areas are so important because I personally, myself, have been working on social initiatives and on education work in the last years. And I actually, uh, animals were not on my mind at all until I uh, met the wonderful Niva and Jonathan, the founder of the Menmon Foundation. Um, animals were completely transparent to me. And then something started to change and I started to see them and change my behavior. Um, you know, the wonder of the human mind, I think, can definitely connect to the fact that we are deeply, we have very rooted thinking patterns and perceptions about our uh, relationship with the animals and it's very challenging to change them. So I think it's not surprising that the youngsters are the ones that are leading this revolution. Um, we are talking about a new generation uh, that is fresh and open-minded and starts to put a huge question mark on the fact that throughout history until today, we see animals as our own property. And I must say that, uh, wait, uh, um, so this is a very promising phenomenon in Israel. We, the service estimates that almost 18% of the youngsters in Israel become either vegan or vegetarian. These are very promising numbers. And this phenomena is just a, not just a youngsters phenomena or Tel Aviv phenomena. phenomena. We are talking about an entire Israeli public that loves and cares about the animals. This field is completely entirely relies on the general public. Unfortunately, the, gen the public systems in Israel om almost completely ignore the animal field. We are talking about a field that has the most volunteers. We are talking about a field that people donate the most after children with cancer. Hundreds of thousands of people that donate small sums every month uh, donate a huge portion of their time to take care of the animals. And why? Why? Why do people care so much? Why must we all care? And it's even if we don't have a natural love for animals. We must internalize the fact that our situation is inseparable from that of the animals. We are intertwined. Um, the One Health concept is summarize an idea that has been known for almost more than a century, which is the fact that the human health and the animal health and our planet health are completely interdependent and dramatically influence one another. And the most dramatic example for that would be the food animal industry. This industry, animals suffer so much and in insane numbers. We are talking about an industry that only in Israel, we talk about 1 million animals that are killed every day for the food industry. In the world, we are talking about half a billion animals every day killed in this industry. And those crazy numbers destroy our planet. It just doesn't make any sense. 
I'm sure you are all aware that the fact that the animal food industry is among the main causes of the environmental crisis and global warming, but I would like to share with you some important numbers. So as, it, as for 10 years ago, I'm sure this number is much higher today. We are talking about 18% of the total greenhouse gas emissions that come from the animal field. The UN declared this field as more dangerous to the environment as, as the whole transportation field together. We are talking about a field that completely depletes the areas, the, the earth of its resources. Almost 50% of the earth's land and 30% of our water consumption is, um, is, is, uh, is used by this by the animal food industry. We're talking about natural forests that we just destroy uh, in order to feed animals. We destroy habitats of thousands of animals. We reduce biodiversity and all of this is in order to feed so many animals so we can eat them. And if we take the amount of food that we feed animals, it's actually double the amount of food needed to feed the billion plus hungry people around the world. And it just doesn't make any sense and it doesn't make any even economic sense. So if we look, we look about sustainable agriculture, we look about numbers that, of populations that is growing around the world, it takes, in order to produce one kilogram of beef, we need 17 times more soil and 50 times more water than to produce one kilogram of soy or any other plasters. So I really believe we cannot address our environmental challenges without talking about the food industry. We cannot talk about the sea and the ocean and we not talk about eating fish. These are completely inseparable topics that we must address. And the environmental situation is frightening, then not, not less frightening are the implications that the animal food industry has on our health. So the poor health condition of animals actually comes back straight to us. We are talking about a significant growth in the last decades of this industry that accelerated it to increase the density of animals, to lower hygienic conditions, and they increase transmission of disease-causing bacteria that comes back to us. And it's not just that we are using so much antibiotics in this field, so we really want to grow the animals as much as possible. We actually pump them, as you can see in this picture, so we can, so they can be most productive. And this antibiotics is so dangerous to us because it produces new strains of bacteria that are resistant to antibiotics. It's estimated that as of today, 700,000 people around the world die uh, from infection with resistance uh, bacteria. And forecasts say that these numbers in 30 years will come to 10 million people. And it's not just the antibiotics. If we look at the diseases that occurred in the last decades, they all come from animals. We are talking about AIDS and SARS, and of course, the corona, the COVID-19. And without no exception, the source of the generator of all of these diseases is always animals. It's always the unnecessary intervention of humans with nature. So I'm sorry I depressed you, it's all true numbers, uh, but I would like uh, to be a bit more op optimistic and to try to shred some light. Um, <clears throat> I think, uh, well, you don't see all the presentation, Never mind. So as much as the poor condition of animals de degrades us, so does the opposite. When we raise the level of the animal health condition, we actually raise the level of the health of the entire population. There are different examples of programs around the world where by providing access to veterinary pet care in poor neighborhoods, you see how they contribute to the health of the residents of the whole neighborhood. This is a picture, I actually have more pictures, you can see them in this mode, but it's a picture of a very um, successful program in the United States that started in New York, um, where they established one health street clinics. So it's actually joint clinics for pets and homeless people. And those programs show that the homeless people take so much better care of themselves because they have the motivation 
to take their pets for pet care. So I really think we should think of how we can incorporate in our public health programs, um, the animal's health, uh, how we can have many more collaborations between physicians and veterinarians so they can work together on the common health of our society. Another example of the inseparable connection between us and the animals, the fact that the ver numerous studies have shown that there is a direct link between violence against animals and violence against people. So a survey done in the United States about the school shoot gunning showed that between 1995 and 2010, all shoot guns at schools, in all of them, the boys that were involved have committed acts of animal cruelty before. We know that 71% of women entering domestic violence shelters in the States report that their partners abused or abused uh, their family pet. We know that 88% of families under supervision for physical abuse of the children actually report that there was a pet abuse in the family. So we actually know that one of the first indicators of distress is animal abuse. And it's very upsetting that in the police systems in Israel, there is almost a complete ignorance of animal offenses. We know that only 4% of the uh, animal offenses complaints are actually being treated. And we know that also in the justice system, they don't take very seriously animal cruelty issues. And we in Manman really try to address this issue. We actually have a conference on this issue at Tel Aviv University this fall uh, that will talk about these relations. And we uh, try to develop programs for judges and for police officials that will uh, address these important issues. The last field that I would like to talk about, I think is a key variable field for a change, which is education. So we must change, I believe, our perceptions towards animals and understand that they are not subject to serve us. Because when we treat the weakened group of animals the way we treat them, we actually learn that the weakest of us can be treated as we please. And this is especially bothering when we think about our children. So you see, most children see animals as natural partners that have feelings and emotions. And children also learn from personal experiences. They actually internalize the relationship models that they are exposed to. So the models that we present them of our relationship with the animals have greatly affect have a great damage, I believe, on their perceptions and behavior towards weakened groups. If we look at our schools, there is a very problematic situation. So we have hundreds of petting corners around the country in our elementary schools, in the community. Only in our schools, there are more than 450 petting corners in the elementary schools. It's one in four schools that have a petting corner. And these corners are where usually early childhood children really meet for the first time many of these animals. And they encounter them. Where do they encounter them? In those petting cor corners, life under captivity, very small cages. And the biggest problem in, is that in those places, our children learn that they don't need to take basic care of the animals. So in many of these places, nobody feeds them on weekends or holidays. We have endless reproduction. Children that are bored can take hamsters for weekends. And anyone that is bored or, or feel like he wants to be relaxed can go to those corners and just enter any cage he wants, pick up any scared animal and just get her. Um, we believe this damage is very, um, <laughs> is very bothering both for the animals and both for uh, future generations. And we are working, especially in the last year, very hard on developing and spreading a different model for the work of children in those places. It's called the mutual model. Uh, we develop it with Aeronim College and this model is actually based on compassion and empathy, because we really believe that we cannot teach compassion and empathy by erasing the others. So we really teach those children different type of relationship, kind and gen gentle relationships that are based on mutual respect. And 
You know, I would really be happy if my kids would treat me like that while I'm taking a nap. And I really believe that if we would learn to treat gently small chickens, then we will definitely be much less forceful people. And when we understood this magical connection, when we understood how much we can, lear we can learn from the relationship with the animals, uh, we started to establish programs of rehabilitation of injured and abandoned animals with distressed communities. Because we see how much these programs really affect the amount of violence and the level of empathy for uh, at risk communities. So this is an example of an animal rescue shelter we established at the Bedouin Youth Village at Nitsana. So we really teach those kids a different attitude, changing from an attitude of power relationship to empathic, respectful relationship. You can view here an example of, you know, at first the kids would just go to the animals and push them and use sticks and ropes and, and, and move them from one place to the other very aggressively. And we start to teach them like how they can use other ways, other methods, for example, a clicker, which takes much more time to move the animal from one place to, our, to another, but it's much more pain, patient and gentle. And we develop such type of programs also at youth villages. So we connect with between abandoned dogs and risk at youth that live at dormitories. Uh, Gabby, so Gabby, I want to ask something from the chat and also to signal that your time is up, but it relates to the last uh, slide. There's a question if you are involved in training service for a uh, training service dogs for victims of sexual abuse or children, children with disability or cancer and things like that. And, and this is the kind of thing that we encourage to connect you know, funders uh, to each other. And I see also contact details in the chat. So maybe just you know, as a, on the level of a yes or no thing, and uh, then you can follow answer, up together. Bill, it's not a yes or no. Uh, <laughs> um, I, 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 would, I will try to short. I will just say that in general, we definitely love those connections and see a lot of value in them. We definitely have a lot of ethics and a lot of this area uh, is dependent, first of all, on dogs produced for this area. So um, all these special dogs that we produce and a lot of the methods to train these dogs are very aggressive. So we definitely believe that, any, uh, that the dogs are not here to serve us. This, I, I believe, <laughs> uh, went through uh, my talk. Um, and we try to make these connections, but we really uh, make sure that the training methods are only based on, um, on um, empathy and only based on uh, positive reinforcement. We, are on, we only make sure to work with abandoned dogs. We have enough of them. We don't need to produce any new dogs. So yes, definitely we work with these communities, but in a bit of different ways. Uh, I'm starting to end. I would last, just say- oh, that uh, Gabby, I think, Gabby, I think we don't have enough time uh, to finish everything, but I think it's really important that uh, you stepped in and you're definitely a resource. And I know that you spend a lot of time also to contact with other funders and help them, give them from your vast experience. So thank you so much. And we'll hear more from Jonathan in the panel. And uh, yeah, and we'll of course send you the full presentation, everyone. So thank you very much. And uh, sorry for cutting you. <laughs> Hey, Sigal, do you want to take it from here? Yes. Okay. Thank you, Gil. Thank you, Gabi. Um, we apologize in advance that time is very tight and we have many speakers lined up. Maybe it's a lesson we should learn for, the, for future uh, content that we develop. Less is more sometimes. And we really want to enable you to also um, ask Gabi questions and other speakers that, have, that will be speaking after. So we'll try to leave a little bit of room at the end for Q&A, Gabi, and I think people will circle back with, uh, with questions. And we also want to say that if you have afterwards have ideas or want to, to pose questions, we'll be happy to put you in touch with each other, connect you to the speakers, of course, and any other uh, connections that you need.
So we want to jump into the second part of the meeting before the third, third part, which is the cooking class, the vegan cooking class. And that's to give you three brief stories from funders who are going to share their perspectives and motivations on their philanthropic involvement in animal welfare, food, and the environment. Um, as Marla said, we have three speakers that will share their stories. And we want to begin with Danielle Eden Scheinberg. Um, Danielle, who's originally from Israel but lives now in Canada, um, together with her husband Rob, established um, a very well-renowned dog sanctuary, which is called the Dog Tail Rescue and Horse Sanctuary. It's been operating for eight years now near Toronto, um, and it has an incredible, pristine 50 acres size of a ranch um, that hosts and um, is a home for abused and neglected animals to heal and re to be rehabilitated rehabilitated while they wait for long-term homes. Um, so we want to let uh, Danielle share a little bit of her story. Gil will put some photos that she shared in the background while Danielle, you're, you speak. And um, I just would like to ask you to, in your brief um, talk, to share a little bit about why you're interested in animal welfare, food, and environment, how your journey begun, um, which arrow or, or vector of influence you chose, um, and what are the opportunities you to see to, that, to influence in the field? And of course, I need to mention that you're also involved in supporting the, the animal welfare field in Israel and the nonprofit sector in Israel that's been operating in these fields. So go ahead, Danielle. Hi, thank you for the introduction. Hi, everyone. And thank you, Gabby, for inviting me and, and all of you guys. Um, so my name is Danielle Eden Scheinberg, and uh, together with my husband, Rob Scheinberg, we have uh, opened an animal sanctuary and dog rescue in Canada. And how we started is we actually used to uh, donate um, to shelters in Israel because we're from Israel originally, we're very connected. And, um, and I, I was always an animal, a crazy animal lover. And I kind of took my husband with me on that. And uh, his family were big supporters of us. Uh, they're all animal lovers. And, um, and, and throughout the years of, of when we started actually uh, dating, my husband and I, we used to donate to small rescues uh, in Israel. And then we kind of slowly discovered that the money is not going towards the animals. Um, specifically in one place. And then was when we felt that donating money is one thing, but doing it yourself is another thing. And that was kind of my dream always, but I never really knew it was my dream. And spontaneously we said, you know, why not open our own place where we can know that actually the money is going towards the animals, we're taking good care of the animals, but doing it a bit different. And by doing it different, I mean, it was very important for us to take the abandoned animals and the stray and homeless dogs and show them in a different light. And to kind of show them in a high end light. So when I came to Canada for a visit, I actually went to a dog show. And when I was there, I was blown away because when in Israel, you know, and like, like uh, they talked before in Israel, there's a lot of like stray dogs that people adopt, you know, from shelter. It's a big thing to adopt dogs. In Canada, what I saw was just purebred that, mm. that people bought from breeders. And it was very new to me because coming from Tel Aviv, I wasn't used to seeing so many purebreds. Mm -hmm. And I said, you know, we should take those stray homeless dogs and, and, and showcase them like, like in a high-end way where people don't feel like they have to go and get this sweet fluffy dog from a breeder they can actually feel the same as they feel to that kind of boutique dog they'll feel that to a stray homeless dog and that's kind of what we did a, a bit a bit overboard as you can see these are the 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 pictures of the dog rooms in our kennel so they're very fancy um, we decided to, to do a very fancy um, and, and, and to, to make sure the rooms are very comfortable and they feel like in a home environment, although they are in a, in a shelter. Uh, and we kind of created a rescue boutique of our, of our own and people really want to be associated with that to the point where uh, if 
if I don't have the right dog to adopt out to this specific family, they would actually wait until I bring new dogs in. So that's one thing that we do here at Dog Tales Rescue in Canada. Um, another aspect, something that's very important is our horses. Uh, we have about 80 horses at the moment. Uh, we have learned that in Canada, unfortunately, uh, people use horses. And by using, I mean, uh, they use them uh, to work in fields. They use them um, to in riding schools for the summer, but then winter comes and they don't want to spend because because owning a horse is not a cheap thing. They just throw them uh, in auctions and they get uh, bought by meat buyers, which many people don't know about it, and they get sent to slaughter. So with learning that, I kind of became a, a horse hoarder and uh, collected them, went to auctions myself and started buying more and more horses. Obviously it's a drop in the ocean what we're doing, but uh, but with that, we're trying and we're not doing that enough. We're trying to educate people about that and, and make sure that more Canadians know about that and doing things uh, with lobbying group and stuff behind the scene to try and get, to get this to end. It's a very big problem in Canada. Um, we uh, work a lot with Israel, to be honest, and to the point that the government once saw us as, as the solution um, to to the problem with the with the, the population of dogs in Israel, so we um, kind of take over um, shelters that are in in dire conditions, and the dogs are just sitting in cages waiting to die. And we take over the shelters and and bring all of the dogs uh, back here to Canada and find them homes. Uh, our biggest project that we have done is a shelter that, uh, that the government has been trying to shut for, for many years and, and they had no solution for the dogs. It was, uh, we call it the 270 project. It was 270 dogs that we uh, brought all of them. It took us, I think it was three years to end this project, but we have successfully done it and the shelter is no longer in Israel and it was one of the worst I have ever seen. And uh, I would say, um, except for two dogs from that shelter, they're, they're all placed in homes. And these are not easy dogs because they have a lot of, um, um, you know, a lot of issues there mentally and physically. Um, but, but I'm very proud of my team uh, with that kind of project. And we do projects like this, um, all over the world. Right now, there's a very bad shelter in Costa Rica with 1,800 dogs that we want to take this uh, project. Uh, that would be for the next five years. And uh, we're, we're going in different islands and then taking um, with, you know, flying dogs, taking uh, cargo planes and flying dogs here. And, uh, and that's pretty much uh, our small contribute towards the animals. Great, Danielle, thank you. First of all, if anyone has questions to Danielle, you can note them in the chat while I'm asking you a question. One aspect that we didn't speak about so much and I understand it's more your husband's side of the family, but your ability as a younger couple to voice your passions to the Family Foundation and bring your input into determining you know, the Family Foundation strategy. So may, I know that often funders approach us that don't necessarily fund environment, but they come to our Green Funder Forum sessions because they say, my children are asking me, what am I doing about the environment? So I need to come and learn more, even if I'm not funding it, to learn about the environment, because that's my way to bring in the next gen into our family philanthropy. So maybe you can just share with two, three brief sentences about your experience from that angle. You mean with, with our family, with the support we got? Yeah. You know, with us, it was very easy because thank God my husband's family, they just love animals and they kind of understood who I am and uh, went with my ideas and I was very lucky. And they're, you know, obviously we could not have done that without them. They're, they're huge supporters of our work and, uh, and they have their opinion when we do something wrong. So it's good, you know, that we can, we have someone that challenges us and, and kind of give us limits as well, but they're, they've been amazing and, uh, and they really believe in what we do. And, uh, and, 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 you know, and, and we're, we're lucky in that way that they really kind of went with our dreams. Great, thanks. Sounds great. 
looks like a great place to go visit when we're all in Canada. Well, um, maybe fun, one yeah. day we'll have one of our Green Funder Forums meetings there. <laughs> sure, 100%. <laughs> so thank you so much. And we're going to move on to our next. Me. Thank you, guys. Thank you. So we're going to move on to our next speaker, Rabbi Adam Frank. Adam, I should say, is uh, definitely one of the um, lively spirits behind initiating this meeting today and has been a real activist around animal welfare. Um, Adam made Aliyah to Israel in 2001, has been a vegan since 2003. He's a conservative rabbi in the congregation of Moreshit Israel in downtown Jerusalem. He also has been supporting and serves on the board of several uh, animal welfare nonprofits in Israel. And, uh, and we really want to hear from Adam now. Again, more or less the same um, framing questions as I posed to Danielle, if you could share a little bit about your journey, your story, how you came about to funding environment, and what do you think the philanthropic opportunities in the field are? And I just want to uh, hop in for a minute and really thank Adam and Lynn for helping with this session, initiating and helping with the content and everything. So thank you so much and, and for your commitment to the issue. The floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Gino. So, although today I'm a conservative rabbi, I grew up in a home that was very Jewish spiritually, less so ritually, um, but social justice and the idea of uh, helping the powerless was just a theme of, of in, our in our homes growing up. Um, so we took a lot of pride in the idea that, that Jews were at the forefront of uh, feminism, of the NAACP helping, helping blacks get their uh, equal rights. Um, and in fact, you know, on the on the forefront of uh, of animal welfare issues as well. Um, I was in when I was in rabbinical school. I got a letter from my brother, who's a lawyer, who's fascinated by the human mind, and he had read a book by Temple Grandin. Temple Grandin is the world's foremost expert in two areas. One is autism, because she herself is autistic, has autism, and the second is animal handling systems, because her autism allows her to sense in the world the same way an animal would sense the world. And she described going to a Jewish, to a, to a kosher slaughterhouse, and she said, if hell exists, that, that, in that place was hell. And he said to me, Adam, if the rabbis allow kosher slaughter to be done in such a cruel and humane way, and we were told the very opposite, how can I trust anything that Judaism has to tell me? So that was in 1997, it became my mission, not only to find out what the truth is, what, but to also uh, not rehabilitate, but at least defend Judaism in the, eyes, uh, in the eyes of my brother, and in fact, myself. So I started researching. And first I, I, I sat with Aaron and I said, Aaron, 95% of Judaism is done right. Let's not throw out the 95% because there's 5% that may be done very poorly, but let's find out what the reality is. So we, we became activists in the area of reforming uh, kosher slaughter practices. Um, and we were successful in many ways, um, but we were not successful in convincing the most important authorities. Those are the ones who are in the Orthodox world and in the Israeli authorities, but we never gave up on it. Um, and I wanna say that um, my motivation is that if I grew up incredibly proud of being Jewish because I felt like we had, we, we, the world is richer because of the Jewish people. The world is richer because of what Judaism has to give to the world. And I, when I became a rabbi, when I was learning to become a rabbi, it was reinforced. So I was incredibly excited that um, all these wonderful things I learned about how Judaism made contributions to the world were in fact true. And one of the great contributions Judaism made to the world was this idea of responsible stewardship toward animals and the world at large and the earth. So the idea is that, that, that Judaism pioneered the idea that we have to protect the earth and all of its resources, and we have to protect the animal world. So when I found out the reality was very different, I, I felt like uh, I needed to be part of the solution. Otherwise, I'd be part of the problem. Uh, so I think a lot of um, what happened to me was just being exposed to the realities of what's happening out there. Um, to learn um, that uh, a kosher, a kosher uh, meat is no different than non-kosher meat when, with respect to factory farming. The animals are raised on factory farms and the kosher, the kosher butcher says, send me 100, 100 cows. 
They don't pick out the Jewish cows. They just take any cows that are on the lot and they send them. So those cows, no matter how they were treated during their lifetime, becomes kosher meat. Finding out the realities of, uh, of the, the, the chicken industry, the fishing industry, the milk industry, uh, the way my DNA doesn't allow me to be part of, doesn't allow me not to see injustice and doesn't allow me to be part of um, the chain of injustice, right? Uh, I give an example sometimes how, how you know, poaching elephants is illegal. Um, so if, if not only if you kill the, the, the elephant to take its tusks, the ivory of the tusks is illegal, but if you purchase that ivory, you're now a participant in the crime. And that's just how my mind works with regards to, uh, to participating um, or, or sponsoring or, or, or being a consumer for industries that are incredibly destructive toward the world and the environment and that are, that are terribly cruel and inhumane to living creatures, the animals. It's not that I believe, it. I don't believe that, that killing an animal, uh, an animal life is, is, has the same value as a, as a, as a, as a, as a human life. Uh, Judaism, Judaism doesn't equate the two, but Judaism tells us that we are required to care for the animal's welfare. We're, we're permitted to uh, utilize what an animal has to offer, but only in conjunction with, um, with our compassionate stewardship. So we're doing a great job of utilizing what animals can offer, but we are failing miserably on the side of how uh, of how we, uh, we treat animals compassionately. Um, what I've, I, I wanna say this too. Whenever I'm in the presence of an animal, it's magical. Whether it's a dog or a cow or a, a snake, anytime I'm in the presence of an animal, we all are mesmerized when we see a majestic animal in front of us, a horse. And um, there's something magical about that because I think we can feel the, um, the, the spirit of the world through animals. So the idea of crushing that spirit with our inhumane uh, practices, uh, I think is antithetical to what Judaism has to offer. Um, so uh, so one, of the, one of the great elements that I've found um, here in Israel is I'm, I'm collaborating, um, my, my family and I are collaborating with the Menmon Foundation um, in creating, trying to build a, a, a visitor center and, a, uh, and an educational center um, to show the realities of all of these industries and the destruction toward the animals, the destruction of the environment, the destruction on human health, the, the, uh, the misappropriation of food resources. We could be feeding the world, with, uh, but we're wasting so many resources feeding the animals that then feed us. And of course, then there's the religious element. If, if, if we're gonna be Jews, whether you're religious Jew, spiritual Jew, ritual Jew, secular Jew, you're, if, we're, if we're Jews, we have a responsibility to be the best of what humanity can offer. And that's what spiritually motivates me to, uh, to change my own practices. Um, and for some people, it's very difficult. For me, it wasn't difficult at all. When I was convinced of something, of the inhumanity and the injustice of something, I don't want to participate. It's that simple. Um, um, anyway, so with, uh, with the Memon Foundation, um, we are, I mean, first, the Memon Foundation have been uh, like a big brother to me um, in, in, uh, in showing me and modeling what does it mean to put your money where your mouth is. Um, so I'm very excited about the work we're doing to build a visitor center and an education center that we think um, can be a light into the, wor into the world because it doesn't exist anywhere else yet. So we're working on that. Um, Adam, I also want to say- Sir, I'm yes. just reading out to you because it's related to your previous point. There are two quick questions in the chat. There are kosher meat providers in the US that have, or at least claim to have more humane and environmentally sustainable practices in both raising and slaughtering animals. Is this done in Israel at all? And is there any hope for kashrut authorities anywhere in the world to one day no longer allow factory farmed animals to be considered kosher? Those are great questions. Um, the first question is, um, unfortunately, even in America, those kosher food sources that say the animals are treated better. Better is not good. So I've researched, I've researched the, uh, the, kosher, the kosher food sources, meat sources in the United States, and none of them pass the sniff test, um, but some are better than others. So if, you're, if you can't get to a place where you can eliminate that food, 
you're right to buy it from those places because it is better, although it's not good. Um, no, there is no, um, there is no initiative like that here in Israel. Um, commercially, it just isn't financially feasible, unfortunately. And as I've, uh, as I've kind of discovered, any industry that, that brings together animals and money is always bad for the animals. It's never good for the animals. So we're not close to, we're not close to having such a, a food source here in, in Israel where, where the animals are treated better. And finally, in terms of, uh, of the Kashrut Authority in Israel uh, requiring or eliminating factory farming, unfortunately, it's not going to be a movement of the religious authorities that's gonna make a change. What's gonna make a change is individual people changing their own, their own private practices to where they, they see the demand for that, for that food goes down and the demand for alternative foods go up. Go up. And perhaps, perhaps creating enough of a grassroots noise to get some legislation uh, and then enforcement that legislation passed. Um, there is no will of, from religious authorities to, uh, to do anything that's going to um, increase the cost of kosher meat. Um, which is going to also lessen the price, lessen the profits um, of those industries, unfortunately. The, 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 the final thing I want to say, this is my piece, is that I'm very excited to find out where the word Jew comes from. Jew comes from the word Judah. And Judah, in Hebrew, the name is Yehuda. Yehuda's mom was Leah. And Leah gave birth to Yehuda, and she said, I'm going to name my son Yehuda because I appreciate God. I appreciate what's in the world. Yehuda and Toda. The word Toda, which is thank you. To be a Jew means to appreciate what's in the world. If our personal practices don't reflect that appreciation, then we're failing the mission. Thank you. Thank you so much, Adam. If people have questions throughout the, the, the next speakers, we feel free to put them in the chats. And I want to introduce our final speaker, Jonathan Inval. Yeah. It's really interesting listening to all of you and how different people come from totally different backgrounds and reach the same passions and the same care about the environment from the Jewish element, from the business sector. And now we have Yonatan who has a, his own unique journey from being a clinical oncologist um, and a serial venture capital entrepreneur who founded the Menmon family office that we heard about from Gabi and from Adam um, together with his life partner, Niva. And uh, they decided to dedicate their life mission of their philanthropy to improve, improve animal welfare. I can tell you as a visitor to their house, their dogs all over the house and cats, they really walk the talk and live the values. And Jonathan, thank you for joining us. And we'd love to hear from you of your unique journey, how this dawned on you and how you chose your path. Thank you, Sigal. And thanks to Adam and Gabi and uh, Daniel and everyone, and everyone joining us. Um, <clears throat> I think I will start just for a minute with explaining a bit more about why non-animal, non-human animals, why focus there, there is so much suffering in the world, and, and why is our focus there on a, on a everybody explained a lot of things here, and um, I, re I really think uh, um, there is a lot, um, there are a lot of good reasons. Um, I believe that about before everything, there's, there's no one issue that has such broad implications on human and human life as uh, veganism. I would gladly uh, send everyone to see uh, Sir Philip Wallen's uh, TED talk or uh, YouTube co uh, talks um, about it. And I, I will quote him. Um, he says, veganism is the Swiss army knife of the future because it solves our environmental, water, human health problem and, and ends cruelty forever. So even if you are very species centered about human beings, um, you should care about this movement. And <clears throat> if you care about the environment, then I think it's something that you cannot, you cannot be an environmentalist without being vegan. And you cannot be vegan without being environmentalist because these things are intertwined, like Gabi said. But uh, Adam is talking about uh, the religion. This is the Jewish uh, Founders Network. We are secular Jews. 
obviously very uh, um, affected by Jewish terminology, uh, religion, uh, tradition. And I think what a bit it's, it's lacking in our main cause because it's not about uh, health and it's, it's even not only about the environment. I think that what motivates us the most is something that is a process it's part of a process of broadening our sense of individualism. So um, we can all agree that the suffering of ourselves is unacceptable, uh, but most people, they broad the sense of individualism. So the suffering of their kids is unacceptable and the suffering of their friends and their neighbors and their countrymen is unacceptable. But when you, when you go further, and if you include all sentient beings, all beings that are capable of suffering, then the, the sentence changes. And it's not the suffering of something is unacceptable, it's just that suffering is unacceptable. And this is the main issue, the main uh, reason that uh, we went in, because after knowing everything, after acknowledging the problem, knowing everything that we know, um, I think there is no greater injustice in the world today than what human beings are doing to farm animals and non-human animals. And this is the reason why we focus on it. Um, not, not only on it, but this is the basic of our focus and everything else derives from it. And this is our main goal. So I've, it was very important for me to start with this but I don't have a lot of time. And um, so I'll tell you a bit about, we will tell you a bit if you will join me about how we started. So I'm a, a medical oncologist, but really it's a different form of philanthropy uh, being in the Israeli health system. Uh, I don't recommend it. Um, so I think basically um, the journey, our journey started when we met each other and under those circumstances, I think this is, was, this was the, the gun in the first act. Um, I was treating Niva's father and uh, <clears throat> I came to a house visit Friday night after I got discharged from the hospital. He was afraid of being a, a, at home alone. And I said, I will come for a half an hour. Uh, it ended up being a four hour visit or a talk. And two important things happened. The first one is that Niva became vegetarian, I think an hour later. So I was vegetarian a bit before, and then Niva also, and then the second, and the most important thing that happened is we became a couple. And we, uh, we actually became a couple around, somehow around also this, this issue. When Niva's dad, they wanted to compensate me somehow for coming, uh, me and Niva, we agreed to donate uh, to an animal welfare NGO. And I think this is what, it, it started, this is what started the journey for us, those circumstances of values and uh, the way we met. And I think also here, the most important maybe a Jewish value, if I was talking earlier about this process of broadening the sense of individual, and if you want it in a, in a Jewish way, it's uh, maybe the most important sentence in the Bible, and then, I, I really believe that it's part of our education. Also, the fact that the Israeli notion that resonates of Tikkun Olam and us trying to really fix the world. And for us, it really also came with this sort of responsibility and um, us being together, having this power to change uh, became a responsibility to change. Uh, with great power comes great responsibility. And I think that for us being there, having uh, this motivation, being together in it and having all this drive and also the means, um, this is what pushed us, the, the sense of responsibility pushed, pushed us together more than anything else. And I'll tell you a bit about, well, be, let's try to be uh, fast because uh, today we are really doing a lot of things. Just, just a bit about how we really got started because there was no, um, yeah, just just really short, and I would. Uh, we started by sporadic uh, giving. Okay, so basically it was and, and Gil stop it whenever and uh, I will if it's too long. Via Facebook mostly, 
Okay, and, and it's it's very ungrateful way of giving because you end up saying much more no's than yes. Obviously, you cannot solve all the problems. And even if it's just for yourself, it's constantly saying no and rarely saying yes. And also you're not you're solving small problems, but you're not participating in any big change. And we didn't give up. Uh, we decided that this is too important. And slowly, slowly, we made it our core focus. Today, this is mainly what both of us are doing. And just, I will be, I'll try to be brief on how we started. If people really want to start and, and make a change and do something, I don't know if it's the best way. And we didn't have a guidebook, or maybe there was a guidebook to uh, uh, vain to read it. <laughs> But um, we started by structuring. So we, we, we started by doing, making, taking a, a, an entity, and today it's our family office, but it's focused on this. So it manages the funds for our activities. And the way it manages the funds, it's also in an impact way and a, a sustainability way in order to make our, our project more sustainable. And as part of, of a strategic way of philanthropy. And we are trying to be there for the long-term uh, in a proactive approach with a long-term process. So it, it was really about the structure and how financially we're building it and, and self-limiting ourselves and letting the, um, the impact investment also um, influence how we give. The most important thing we did after having a structure or even during and before is hiring people. And this is extremely important. This is the most important things we did. We did. Value per money. And you, you also, Gabi, uh, which we were very lucky to work with. Um, Gabi and the team, the Menmon team, you obviously, Udi, maybe I am not, it's part, it's part of our family. And uh, those are the people that are enabling us to give. One minute, okay. And um, so really important, every cent in salary gives itself back 100,000 times. The next thing we did, because we didn't know anything, is we learned. And Gabi, for the first six months, I think, working for us, it was just about us um, learning, uh, trying to understand what are our goals, define our goals, and some of the ground rules, I probably won't have time to get into them, the, the, the ground rules of how we, uh, how we operate. Jonathan, there's a yeah. question here for you. I don't know if you want to address it now, but how did becoming an oncologist factor into your journey to veganism and also to this area of philanthropy, if at all? Uh, of course it did. So uh, first of all, I think uh, I was a meat eater until my early thirties. My mom is a vegetarian uh, from, I think from at least 40 years, 50 years she's vegetarian. I was influenced, but not influenced enough. And I really, really think that uh, working in the hospital, working in the oncology world, and um, besides of um, having this really an important scientific approach to understand the, the damage. I think it's the fact that you are, um, you cannot take, you are very aware of the suffering of the world and of individual people. And, um, you know, we, you work so hard to reduce such a small amount of suffering from another being, and then you go and eat a schnitzel. And uh, these things, they resonate. And I think it, it makes, I, I do know a lot of, uh, obviously not all, but a lot of physicians uh, that are uh, leaning through this kind of flexitarian and uh, also having the possibility and the tools to to understand the data, all the data, scientific data. I think being a scientist and, and having the approach to understand and, uh, and, and, and <clears throat> so I think, yeah, it was important. It was really important. Obviously it wasn't the only uh, thing that drew me there, but it had uh, some kind of influence. 
Thank you. And do you want to summarize in a final sentence? Yeah, I wouldn't be able to summarize in a final sentence. <laughs> just, uh, I would just say this. Um, whoever is interested, we are always available to answer any question. And uh, if you're interested in the things that we're doing, or you want some advice, uh, all of us, all the men team, we would love uh, to help anyone who wants anything to do with this area. We, we really believe that um, this is the time. And uh, we believe that the change is imminent and we want to grease the wheels of change. Change is imminent, we want it faster and bigger and better. And this is where we're focusing on, really. Thank you very much. Jonathan, I just, I just wanted um, uh, to mention one uh, comment from the chat. Uh, by Yosef Abramovich uh, saying, how about working together to put a carbon tax on beef in Israel uh, in time for Shemitah? And he's happy to be helpful in that. And I think it really relates to your um, new initiative to connect the environmental organizations and their tools and you know ways of influencing to the world of uh, animal welfare and uh, Etc. So this is just a comment, and I'm sure you can follow up on that afterwards. We are actually working on uh, subsidizing. Where do we subsidize? What do we subsidize? How can we find the polluter, give him a fine, and then subsidize the thing that pollutes? And these are the things that we are working on. I think that we understood very early that change is involved in public opinion. We are not going to change public opinion. Beyonce in a tweet will do more than I can do in a year but we can influence uh, where the, the people with science, with the, the academic, with our business approach, with, uh, with our uh, other approaches, we can really make the change that will make it easier for the for change to come. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. M Marla, we're handing it back to you. Uh, yes, Yonatan, I also, I really enjoyed your presentation and um, I'm always looking to increase the number of philanthropists involved in these issues. So maybe you can host a who bite for uh, some other people in the medical fields to jump in as well. Uh, we are now at our last portion of the program and I'm really pleased to introduce my very good and old friend, well, longtime friend, Lynn Weinstein. Lynn and I both moved to Israel at the same time about 25 years ago. Uh, Lynn practices as a psychotherapist here in Jerusalem and really enjoys cooking vegan meals for her family. And I want to just mention that while both Lynn and Adam, who presented before, are vegan, their children are not all vegan. So I think what we're going to learn from Lynn tonight is something tasty and something that works well for your entire family, whether or not you are all vegan. Welcome, Lynn. Thank you so much. Thank you, Marla. Um, so I'm just going to say briefly how I became vegan. I had been vegetarian in my young adult life um, because of animal welfare issues. Then I met and married Adam, and he introduced me to the world of factory farming and the horrors of it. And I couldn't look back. Um, so I became vegan. Slowly, I was pregnant. I had children, I nursed, I wasn't so vegan then, but once the kids were a tiny bit older and I stopped nursing, I became vegan. Um, I love food. I love eating food, I love cooking food, I love serving food, and it was definitely a challenge to learn how to create um, healthy, delicious vegan meals for my family. Uh, I'll get in a little into a little bit more of um, how I um, choose what meals to serve, but I just wanna say like Marla did that uh, we have three kids, one of whom is vegan, as of a couple months ago, and two of them are vegetarians. So what I do is I make, all the meals I make are vegan. Our dinners at night and our meals during Shabbat, vegan. So today I'm gonna to make a meal that is fun, easy, and um, has less options. So at the end you'll see. So I am making macaroni and cheese bowls. So I'm gonna start with making an Italian herb Parmesan cheese. we have one garlic clove, one tablespoon of thyme, and one tablespoon of rosemary. You know, I did my lemon. 
I'm going to add to that cashews, which are a vegan's best friend. They're, they have protein. They can become creamy. They take on other flavors, and um, they're delicious. Unroasted. Unroasted. Two tablespoons of nutritional yeast here in Israel. It's I've cut shmolim. Shmolim, as my son Nadav is saying, correcting my Any questions, please just start posting. This is two teaspoons of red wine vinegar, one quarter teaspoon sea salt, one teaspoon extra virgin, virgin, virgin olive oil. And we're just gonna put this in here for about five to 10 seconds so it has a little bit of a chunky consistency. Check it. Put more. I don't want it to be too fine. There we go. You can maybe see the consistency. Yeah, so it's ready. I'm going to put that aside while I make the vegan cheese sauce. You can try it, sure. Okay, so for the vegan cheese sauce, I'm going to use the Vitamix. Yum. Pulling it up, yum. Really okay, so this appliance, the Vitamix, is the appliance we use the very most in our kitchen. Um, it's a really high power blender that can pulverize pretty much. Um, if you don't have a Vitamix, which tend to be expensive in Israel, there are other products, particularly the Ninja blender, which is much, much less expensive. It wasn't around when we bought this Vitamix. And in the States, there are lots of other options as well. So. To make the cheddar sauce, I'm going to put in a cup and a half of cashews, again, cashews, about three quarters cups water, a half a clove of garlic, three tablespoons of lemon juice, half a teaspoon mustard, Dijon mustard, I'll make it get rid of the pasta if you want. One and a half teaspoons of sea salt, a quarter cup of nutritional yeast. You'll see that some of the ingredients repeated themselves. That happens in vegan cooking. Okay, now I'm gonna take about a minute or two to blend all of these. So I just want to use the time that Lynn is blending to say that we're going to share with you, and it's also on the chat, a, a Google Doc with the recipes and also links to excellent websites that can really introduce you to vegan cooking, which is really easy and like fun and also suitable for non-vegan, you know, eaters. So we just shared it, shared it in the chat, and now Lynn, we can go to you. So let's get the pasta over. Great, guys, it was that simple. Once you gather your ingredients. Okay, so now I'm gonna mix them together with my macaroni. Obviously you can use any pasta, but I tried to mimic the traditional macaroni and cheese formula that's so successful. This is a little watery, more watery than usual, but that's okay, it'll get absorbed. Um, while I'm mixing, I just want to say that what tends to work for our family are ethnic dishes that are tasty and flavorful, like pasta and lasagnas and homemade pizzas and Asian stir fries and Mexican wraps and Mexican, um, what else do we do Mexican? Burritos. Burritos. Burritos seven layer dips. Seven layer dips and um, tacos. We make veggie burgers. We buy veggie burgers. Um, Things with lots of fun flavor. So here we go. I'm going to add a drop of salt and pepper at the end. Soups. Soups are Soups. Really good. And by the way, another good trick, if you want to get started with a little bit of a vegan diet, maybe even once a week, is to make a big pot of beans and to make a big pot of rice in the beginning of the week. And just kind of play around with them. Um, and you can make salads with them and soups with them. You can do wraps with them. Um, they're your staples, beans and rice. So here is the mac and cheese. And 
What I like to do is have add-ons for the family. So Adam and the dog, if you'll bring over the add-ons, I'll show them what we have here. Great, we have some sauteed mushrooms and some roasted tofu and we have some herbs and sauteed greens, broccoli and, and chips with chard and hot sauce and roasted, roasted tomatoes. Um, I don't know if you can tell this. So I'm gonna have Adam and Adab fill themselves up a bowl. You can also do this with Buddha bowls, as you're probably aware. And there you have a vegan, quick vegan dinner. It's healthy as well. So what's a Buddha bowl? Oh, what's a Buddha bowl? A Buddha bowl is a grain, um, rice or quinoa, and you add on to it, kind of whatever you want like this. So if you guys get started, you could add in roasted mm -hmm. vegetables, fresh vegetables, herbs, nuts, seeds, protein, like tofu, tempeh, um, what other, seitan, um, beans. And there are people who actually, like I said, with the rice and beans, create Buddha bowls every day. You start at the beginning of the week, maybe on a Sunday night or mostly Shabbat, and make a bunch of these different things, throw them in the refrigerator, pick and choose what you want during the week. Um, and they're a balanced meal and they're fun. Do different dressings, the peanut dressing, Italian dressing. Um, you can kind of go crazy. So uh, there's some resources for you that are available. I'm always available um, if you have questions. I love helping people figure out how to make delicious vegan meals. And Dad, Adam, let me know what you think of, of the dish. Lynn, thank you so much. This is Marla jumping back in. Lynn, that was really awesome. And I wanted to also mention that Lynn herself is, has a Pinterest page. Is that right, Lynn? Yeah. Uh, so yeah, it's, it's some, under, yeah. under Lynn Weinstein. So we put some resources in the chat, but just know that you can go to Lynn. I see Tamara. Tamara is like your neighbor in Baca. Maybe you can go over there and uh, partake. I love it. Come tomorrow. Tomorrow we've got dinner. We have plenty come. of food here. My parents are in love. Mom and dad, come on over. Lynn, you made that look easy. So, um, yeah, go Nadav. Uh, so, with that, Seagal, do you want to wrap up the? Sure, yeah. I'll wrap up. Thank you so much, Lynn and Adam. Thank you. Um, that's really hard watching a cooking class on Zoom and then you become hungry at home and that's already, but it's, in, you know, in a different city. Um, so it was very inspiring. So we want to quickly wrap up, first of all, thanking everyone for joining us today and staying with us. I'm reminding you, if you still have last minute questions that you want to put in the chat, feel free. And a few quick announcements. First of all, Hopefully, this is one of the last Zoom sessions we're going to do as an automatic default. Of course, we're going to continue to have occasional, occasional Zoom sessions so the international funders who are not based in Israel can join us. But we're hoping to go back into in-person um, Green Funder Forum meetings in Israel. And the first one planned for all of us is on August 30th which is going to be a festive toast for Rosh Hashanah, just before Rosh Hashanah. We'll be sending you details once we finalize them, but please hold that date. There is also an upcoming conference by an organization called Salut Tzafuf, which is talking about um, population growth in Israel and the environmental implications. Alon Tal founded that nonprofit, and they have a conference coming up on June 27th. We also have JFN's annual conference coming up on the end of October, October 25th to 27th, in person in, Jeru in Tel Aviv in Israel. So those of you in Israel and those of you outside of Israel want to come to Israel for our annual conference, you're most welcome. We're going to have a program on environment, and we're also going to have a post-conference tour day. Um, a site visit on environmental issues in Israel. So we're gonna be very happy to have any of you join us if you want during the conference and the post-conference. And to remind you again, that if you have any ideas for sessions, any content that you're seeking, any connections to other funders in the field of environment, animal welfare, um, veganism, or anything under this broader umbrella of sustainability and environment, feel free to use us as an address, Marla, Gil, myself, um, and we'll be happy to put you in touch with each other. We'll be happy to be challenged to develop content for you to really answer the things that you care about and are looking to get more knowledge to be able to be more um, effective in your philanthropy. I want to thank all of our speakers today for joining us and taking the time to prepare. Of course, Gabby and Adam for helping us really initiate and develop the content. And of course, Gil and Marla 
who without you, the Green Funders Forum wouldn't be operating and uh, your real powerhouses behind it. And we're very happy that we have this forum. It's much easier to feel like a community when we come together in person. So we really hope as many of you as can will join us on August 30th so we can really meet and, uh, and see each other in 3D um, at the end of the summer. Marla, and did I, I forget anything? No, but Sigal, thank you. I did want to join, jump back in for this mutual love fest. Sigal, we are so appreciative for you uh, to be part of our Green Funders team. We do not take it for granted. Sigal, as you know, uh, many of you know, has a really strong background in environment herself with a master's degree and was the director of the Green Environment Fund before she began uh, with the JFN and of course serves as the deputy director of JFN Israel. So we we're glad that she's able to dedicate part of her very, very busy staff time uh, to the Green Funders Forum. And I think a great deal of our success is because of that. So thank you, Sigal. And I do want to also put out there, I mentioned at the beginning that we are laying the groundwork for a collaborative fund in the for Israel's environment. We have a, a lot more work to do, but keep that in mind uh, for your future funding. And then also to say that as part of our mission of the Green Funders Forum is to really help people take the information and then develop your own strategies. And so we personally, we offer consultations with Gil and Sigal together as a team. Those are free of charge, but you are welcome to approach us. We encourage you to approach us. This is something that we offer. You're interested in an environmental topic, but you don't quite know how to fund or how much of your funding to dedicate or how to be effective. We have learned through other funders who have taken advantage of this opportunity that they are really life changing in terms of their philanthropy. So please, please do turn to me, Sigal or Gil, and schedule a consultation. We're happy to provide that. This is where the real impact is. And I can say that this is one of my goals as being the co-chair of the Green Funders Forum. This is the impact that I want to have. So please don't be shy and do approach us. And we're just delighted so many of you joined us. Um, Gabby, Adam, again, thank you so much. And um, we are going to also send Gabby's presentation around the PowerPoint around uh, to all the participants. And for me, I am interested um, in animals, uh, specifically how it relates to the environment. And Gabby had some very important information in her presentation about the water use and the land use. Uh, that it takes when we uh, are animal eaters. And so for me, that's really the intersection. So I hope everybody will keep that in mind as well. So signing off and hope to see you in our August and October programmings and in consultations. Thank you so much. Thank you. And I just want to thank Gabby for all the help and the OAV and also Rachel Azaria, the chair of Life and Environment. It was also behind the scenes with Adam. Uh, so thank you and look forward to see you all soon. Please use us to connect each other and we'll take it from there. Good night. Bye, everybody.